moving on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham with me, JJ Inisiobi. You're with Talk on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Coming up, it's time up for the Tories. Labour launches its local election campaign, vowing to level up, an agenda brought in by Boris Johnson. Plus, the King broadcasts a pre-recorded audio message from Maundy Thursday, but he is nowhere to be seen. And Thames Water's in deep trouble, as investors are to pull funding unless the company agree to a huge rise in bills. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of me. JJ and this Yobi, it's the second night of my dictatorship, and I'll be holding the fort for Concrete Growing Mike. It's all happening tonight, and I've got a jam packed show for you. Battleground Britain hots up as Labour announced their local election campaign. They say they're going to create 650,000 jobs, but can we trust Keir Starmer to do it? Plus, you wouldn't believe which country the UN has picked to lead a women's rights forum. It is literally beyond belief. And find out in a moment why I'm absolutely fuming over the decision to put a trigger warning on children's books. This is the Independent Republic. Brace yourselves. Well, we all know the world is getting madder by the minute, but did you know the Mad Hatter was part of a white supremacy regime? Me neither. But that is what is being claimed by one British university that says Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan are among a collection of kid stories that have been given a trigger warning for white supremacy. So let me get this straight. York St John University has added the disclaimer to a collection of historical kids' books, including works by J.M. Barry, Lewis Cowell and Jules Verne. Students are being warned that these classic tales, which were made for kids, may contain offensive examples of white supremacy. Now, surely I'm not the only person who thinks this is bloody madness. Are there certain lines of dialogue in Peter Pan where he talks about the natives in a way that today would be described as racist? Yeah. Is there some sexism in the way that the little boy who never grows up talks to and about Wendy? Yeah, there is. So what? Pan wasn't written today. It's a clear example of its time. I've read Alice in Wonderland, for example, and I thought the story was about a girl who took some drugs and goes on a crazy trip. Sam is what I'm talking about. But either way, I don't need a trigger warning for it. We saw something similar last year when they went a step further and actually changed the content of old books that the so-called powers that be, these boffins, deemed to be too offensive. Remember Roald Dahl's work uh, had the word fat swapped for enormous because, God forbid, someone overweight may take offence at hearing a word that could trigger them. Well, a spokesman for the university has tried to defend this ridiculous decision and said, as custodians of the Reese Williams collection, we have a responsibility to provide both uh, access to historic books and to inform our students. Blah, 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 blah. It just goes on like that, basically. It seems plain to me that in order to protect people's feelings from hurty words, this university and several others like it are breeding a generation of soft, intolerant young adults who haven't got enough resilience to read something that they may find offensive. They may find offensive. So we're being left with a generation, a, a Gen Z cohort, who will continue to erase the past and shut down and cancel anyone who has thoughts different to their own. And then we wonder why this country is heading the way that it is. Today, it's Alice in Wonderland. And I promise you, tomorrow, it'll be the Bible. Because in the Bible, well, we've got, we've, got, um, we've got slavery, we've got parents sacrificing their kids, there's prostitutes being threatened with death, there's babies being massacred, remember that one? Every firstborn child. Oh, and a very violent end for the main character in the Bible. Spoiler alert, though, he makes a comeback. There's going to be a sequel. Mm -hmm. Today, at this very second, we have kids in this country living in poverty. People working more hours than ever before, still unable to pay their bills, and a health service, service on its knees. If I have a heart attack and I call an ambulance, there's no guarantee the ambulance is going to turn up in the next 20 minutes. It might be four hours away. But you want to be offended about old stories and some words. Well, if you are offended by these old kids' books that are a true reflection of outdated attitudes of their time, may I politely suggest you get in the bin, you absolute waste of space. 
and breathe. On to our first story now. Sir Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner launched Labour's local election campaign today in my hometown of Dudley. There was a promise of national renewal. Make no mistake, Labour has a plan to get Britain's future back. A plan to drag politics in this country back to service. Tilt our economy back towards the interests of working people. Get us building again, working again, growing again by unlocking the pride and potential of communities like Dudley. Starmer accused the Conservatives of preying on the hopes of working people by making big promises on levelling up and then failing to deliver. He also called out Prime Minister Rishi Sunak for failing to call a general election and accused him of running scared. Look, I do have to be honest. I was hoping we'd be launching a different election campaign here today. But the Prime Minister bottled it. He wants one last drawn-out summer tour with his beloved helicopter. <laughs> so we need to send him another message. Show his party once again that their time is up. The dithering must stop. The date must be set. Britain wants change and it's time for change with Labour. Yeah, good one, Kia. Right, let's bring in tonight's cabinet. Joining us is the editor of Spiked Online, Tom Slater, political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister, and broadcaster, Sam Dowler. Um, I'm not going to have two Sams on the panel, so let's just call you Good Sam <laughs> and you Average Sam. <laughs> so, Good Sam, first of all, <laughs> please remind me, um, what did the, the Tories propose with levelling up? What is it they promised us? Well, it, it was about rebalancing the whole economy of the nation, moving the economy outside of London, where obviously it's centralised, and, and redistributing that across the country. Now, obviously, um, that hasn't really happened in the way that Boris Johnson promised it would. But to be fair to him, he did have to contend with the pandemic. I, I think it's important that we do remember that. And actually, everything's put on hold during that period. Since then, obviously, we had the invasion of Ukraine and the knock-on impact we've had on the UK. So I think it's a bit unfair to, um, to judge the Conservatives by a manifesto that was written before the invasion and before a global pandemic. Tom, some people are saying that the dreaded Brexit word, the B word, that was also a problem because the, the government's uh, attention was diverted to that instead. Well, I wouldn't say that. So, I mean, if you think about the economic situation in which we find ourselves at the moment, you look at the comparisons in terms of continental Europe where, um, you know, it's, there's not obviously a huge difference. I agree with Sam as far as I think it was the kind of more external shocks than that. It was the war, it was COVID that really knocked things off, of course. But at the same time, I think it's also worth stressing that the Tory party were always going to be up against it in terms of proving to those former Labour voters that they were really on their side. Even early on in the pandemic, as rough as things were, there were still kind of indications, the Hartlepool by-election, whatever, that voters were sticking with them. But I think over time, it just it just ran out. And the, the fact that the so quickly over the last, since the last election, you've got Labour Campaigning in those constituencies, again, and actually getting a hearing, I think, speaks to how much the Tory party squandered that election, definitely. Mm. Uh, average, Sam. To you now. <laughs> <laughs> I've never uh, been called average in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's promotion for you then, isn't it? Um, so Starmer went to my hometown. He went to Dudley. Do you know where Dudley is? Dudley? Dudley. You know the accent? Yes, yeah, the Lenny Henry made Dudley <laughs> famous. Yeah, that was basically it. I probably ruined its reputation a little bit. <laughs> but Starmer's gone there and put us back on the map. He's speaking to a working-class town. It is a proper working-class area. It's um, a very multicultural community. He is talking all about levelling up and putting money back in the pockets of the working class and rebuilding Britain. That's a good thing, right? Well, that's what, um, that's what the whole point of what, um, when Boris Johnson came up with it to begin with, that was the whole point. It was to, it was to stop everything being so South-centric, so London-centric. And, you know, obviously it hasn't happened, and I agree with you, like, you know, whether you know, there, was, there was a thing called a pandemic, there was Brexit, which, you know, you, even as we sit here today, we, we, we still don't even know whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so, like... I think I think he's speaking to the right people, and he's, and I have to agree with him when he says that um, that he wants that 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 Sunak wants one last summer because like he, I don't know whether Sunak thinks that he's going to somehow be able to turn around all of his massive amounts of crises in the next couple of months and somehow change change these awful polling figures, but like. You have to be honest, the amount, the amount of Tory MPs are already not going to be standing. Like, what is it now, 80 or something like that? Like, this is it's a huge, a huge amount of people. So these are people who are jumping chip already. The, the game is over. The jig is out for him. I don't know. I, I, and, I, and I do think it is a bit 
I don't know, like he's squatting in number 10 before, you know, at the end of the day, because Kia's going to be in there at some point this year. Good Sam. I mean, Good wow. Sam. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry, Starmer said, yeah, but as much as he's going to help level up and spread the wealth around, he's not going to turn the taps on. Birmingham City Council's gone bankrupt. Mm. He's not going to help us. I mean, the, the Conservative Party did make this point that he's got a bit of a brass neck to go to the West Midlands and launch his campaign about how he's going to transform Britain when the council's gone bust under Labour's watch. Yeah. And we've seen many examples of that. Croydon, um, where I think the council tax has gone up 15% because of the, uh, the, the terrible investments made by that council. Um, so you, you, you can see there's a litany of, uh, of kind of bad spending by Labour councils that people can look at. You can look to Wales and how that's been run if you want a taster of what's to come under a Keir Starmer government. I think on the election point, though, I would say... <laughs> I mean, it was a concocted Labour story, wasn't it, this, this May election? It was completely confected. No. They, they enjoyed ramping up talk of a May election. It was never on the cards. It was never on the cards. Mm. Here's Dharma did it, so he could just do those little kind of snipey comments that we just saw there, saying Rishi Sunak's bottled it. There was never any serious consideration of May. Um, and so I think, you know, let's, let's, they can find they can have their fun, but really it was just, uh, it was just a little stunt by Labour. Well, when are they going to have the election then if it's going to be during summer? I thought our MPs like to have some time off. I, <laughs> I, would, I, would, lay, I would lay £100 on it being uh, after summer. Hundred pounds. Yeah, I'll take that bet. Take the bet. Yeah, take I'll the bet. take that bet. We don't, want, we don't want a winter general election. Oh, not no, another one. They're I mean, just, they're barbarous. Just, just personally, professionally, yeah. I hate going out uh, when it's raining and dark. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of <laughs> going course. all over the country, you never see daylight. You know, all that of kind of course. stuff. That, but that's my personal gripe. Obviously, if you're the prime minister and you've got um, the, the the point, uh, you've got a few months left where the economy can grow, mm. you can get a flight to Rwanda, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, why would you not take that opportunity to he's see if things can turn around? Well, I don't think he's running out of time. desperate stuff. Yeah. Dharma's also said we can grow our way out of it. I seem to recall Truss and Kwarteng mm. saying something similar. That didn't end so well. well do, I mean, I think everyone can agree that what we need is economic growth, but does anyone really trust Keir Starmer to be the one who's going to instigate that, not least because of the fact that his economic ambitions are pretty limited? I have to say, though, watching his speech there, you know, with his shirt sleeves, you know, doing his whole kind of, like, man boring of supply teacher. Really. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's shooting for man of the people, but it's coming <laughs> off some, somewhat differently. You do think... What do you have to be like to be losing to that, as what is Sunak is at the moment? It is incredible, the fact that, you know, the last few years, politics got a bit more interesting post-Brexit, mm -hmm. in good ways and in bad ways in some respects. But at the same time, it did feel like that kind of empty soup politician that we felt like we were lumbered with for some time was a thing of the past. Yeah. Apparently not, because they're back in the form of Sunak <laughs> and Keir Starmer in a big way. Well, again, Starmer's saying he's going to... Labour going to devolve more power, but Tories have been doing that as well. Well, I, I listen to Starmer and I hear Sunak. I, I think, don't see I the difference. Sorry so to agree with George Galloway, but I don't see the difference between the two of them. <laughs> More devolution is madness, particularly if you are Keir Starmer, because we can see from Andy Burnham, all you create is a king of the north who then mm -hmm. just throws rocks at uh, the Prime Minister. And if that Prime Minister happens to be a Labour Prime Minister, and then you're creating more of these characters all over the country, I mean, that's just politically insane to me. Full fat devolution, he said. They're, lo they're, <laughs> losing, they're losing because of... They're not just losing to Keir Starmer. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily, I think, even about Keir Starmer. It's, it's the well, chaos. By default, it's, the, it's the It's the, it's the <laughs> yeah. chaos. Is that, you know, that even, you know, obviously even Tory voters, especially Tory voters that voted for the first time in the last election, have just seen just a, a monstrous, like... like they, they, they haven't seemed to be able to do anything right. They can't, they can't keep a prime minister. They can't stop backbiting. They can't stop... I, I, I suspect there will be plenty more people um, popping over the road to um, reform. And, you know, and this is... And especially, like, Liz Truss, for example. Yeah. Like, this is... Like, this is you, they, they are... They're collapsing in front of our very eyes. So, of course, people aren't going to... People, you know, see... Oh, Angela Rayner's been in her job for a couple of years now. Oh, well, let's, let's go... Let's let go for stability. She's got, she's got four. <laughs> let's go for Angela Rayner. Um, I found Angela Rayner so cringe today. So she said um, the Prime Minister was the political equivalent of that friend from back home who says he'll get the first round in if you pay for the taxi, and yet when you get to the bar, he's nowhere to be seen. <laughs> and then she said, she said about, about Starmer, he's the man who does always get his round in. And then he made some joke about her cocktails being lethal or whatever. Boo it's jokes. so cringe. It works with the Brits. It's it awful. Someone's got, someone, <laughs> someone, someone has to hire a good speechwriter, has to hire a good gag man. The, the dross we've been subjected to over recent years, and particularly given the fact that, you know, the jokes are bad enough, but the delivery is so dreadful. You know, I'm, I'm not one of these people who think that, you know, charisma and presentation is everything in politics. That can become a substitute for substance. 
But given the fact that there is so little substance, at least give us a bit of a show. But we don't get that. <laughs> like, well, like that, bring back the Maybot. Is that, is that what you're saying? <laughs> when that was a show than and a half. Well, oh, speaking of Dross, you've actually surprised me tonight. I'm going to elevate you from average Sam to just above average Sam. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Oh, well, okay, <laughs> stay around. We'll hear more from you guys in a bit. You are watching the Independent Republic of JJ. Now, back in action, the Royals are set to return for Easter Sunday service, putting health battles, family feuds, and PR disasters behind them, apparently. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. It's a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ and this year will be here on Talk TV. The King was not present at the Monday Thursday service this afternoon, with it instead being led by Queen Camilla. Charles opted to do a pre-recorded audio message for the service, which in light of recent royal turmoil was not the most transparent way of conveying his sentiment. But hopefully the lack of visuals don't lead to yet more conspiracy theories. But in more shocking news, the disgraced Prince Andrew is set to be walking with the King to commence the Easter service at Windsor Castle. Now, joining me in the studio is Royal Commentator Victoria Arbiter. Now, Victoria, do we know, first of all, why the King wasn't in vision? We hear his voice, but don't see his face. Yes, very practical reasons, actually, JJ. Simply that Worcester Cathedral does not have the ability to broadcast video images. So you may remember at the Commonwealth Day service, the King did a video message for that. This is sort of the way he's doing these big set piece events at the moment, because yeah. it's a way to have a presence. It's a way to reassure people while also maintaining uh, the, his health. It's not sensible to be around lots of people. So it was Worcester Cathedral said, well, we can do audio, but we're not quite set up for video. Hmm, OK. But you can see why people are going to think there's something else going on. There's so many conspiracy theories anyway around the royal family now. 
Some people are going to say, could not just get someone with a mobile phone to go in and film it for, for him, no? Well, it's a nice idea. I think, <laughs> I think the fact they could actually have done the videoing, it's just there wasn't any way to play it. And mm. unfortunately, these conspiracy theories, it's kind of they've taken on a life of their own, haven't they? And they've spiralled yeah. out of control. But I think, I think the great British public, for the most part, recognises that social media doesn't represent the greater whole. And when they've been polled and we've chatted to man on the street, they've all said, we know everyone's fine, we know why it is that they're not appearing in public. We understand, and I think sympathy's on their side. Um, I was very happy to see that King Charles uh, quoted the Bible uh, in, in, his, in his address to the nation. In a time when Christianity, I feel in this country, is becoming a little bit less prevalent, um, how, how influential and significant is that that Charles is going back to we are, we are a, a part of the Church of England. It's fantastic. We absolutely are, and he's the head of the Church yes. of England. And I think he's taken a lot from his late mother. He's a very spiritual man himself, not just Christianity. He's a man who has embraced all faiths. He's learnt about all faiths. He learnt the Quran. This is a man who's really interested and has preached religious tolerance uh, for over 40 years. But I think he recognises that Easter in particular is one of the most important uh, events on the Christian calendar. Mm -hmm. And for his late mother, the Queen, she was very spiritual. She was a devoutly religious woman. And she felt particularly connected to Maundy Thursday. So he will have been very disappointed to miss this. It's only the second Maundy Thursday of his reign. So the yeah. fact that he wasn't there will have hit hard. But I think it was important to him to share a Christian message. And we saw that in the Bible verse that he chose, but also in the actual message. It was about service. It was about kindness. It was about extending the hand of friendship. And I think those are all messages that we could stand to hear right now. Is that a message he's trying to do towards uh, William and Harry, maybe? Maybe. Do you know what? We <laughs> could read between the lines on everything. It could also be a, like reaching out to conspiracy theories, theorists who were just promoting the most heinous stuff on social media. Like, just pause, take a moment, look at your neighbour, look at your fellow man, reach yeah. out the hand of friendship. I'm happy he didn't quote anything about Cain and Abel, because that really would have set tongues wagging. Um, <laughs> when are we going to see King Charles then? That's a very good question. I think they've done a phenomenal job in terms of making sure we do see him through pictures on social media. Of course, the pandemic did allow for a, mo a monarch to become sort of a virtual monarch. The Queen's mobility issues meant she wasn't out and about as well. Um, but I know people are ready to see him in those forward-facing engagements. And the first of those is going to be Easter Sunday. He is going to lead the family to a church service at St George's Chapel. It's going to be a reduced number, a much smaller congregation, because, yeah. of course, he's following doctor's orders. It's not sensible while you're going through chemotherapy to surround yourself with lots of people. But King Charles is a man who loves a walkabout. You'll often see his wife going, come on, darling, come on, come on. <laughs> he likes to be with people. He likes meeting people. He likes having conversations with people. So I think we will start to see a ramp up based on what the doctors think is viable, what's possible and what's not going to compromise his health. So garden parties, they may be a little bit of a stretch, but I know he's certainly going to be working towards being able to appear for Trooping the Colour. Uh, look, it's no secret. Anyone who watches Watches me on this show on the talk knows I'm not a fan of Prince Andrew. I don't even want to call him Prince Andrew. I'm going to call him Andy because he doesn't deserve that respect. Is he going to be there on Sunday cowing behind uh, his, his, his brother? Possibly. And I think you're speaking for the masses when you say that you're not terribly fond. I think that is the general feeling across the across the Commonwealth, not just in the UK. All we know at the moment is that members of the royal family will join the King and Queen Camilla. Mm. Some would argue that church is exactly where Prince Andrew probably should be. Um, but <laughs> it's never a, a popular image when he's seen. I think there was a lot of bad press, wasn't there, when there yeah. was the memorial service for King Constantine and Andrew was perceived to be leading the royals. Actually, anyone who really... You'd have to really closely follow the royals to understand this. They were there in precedent. So actually, although he was at the front, he was actually representing the back of the pack uh, because they go in order of precedent. But for anyone taking the pictures and for regular people just looking at those images, it looked like he was kind of leading the charge, laughing yeah. and joking. It didn't go over well. Mm. So I'm hoping to see the King front and centre. And Andrew, if he is there, he does live in Windsor. Chances are he will be. But hopefully we'll see a little more humility from him and <laughs> more of a backseat position. So we've seen protesters uh, outside the cathedral today. I'm hoping there'll be protesters outside the church on, on Sunday against Andrew, not against King Charles. 
Do you think it's likely, well, apart from me being there to say, down with Andy, you think people are going to turn up and say, get rid of him? I do think it's interesting that in the King's reign, we're seeing more of these protesters. Now, they were there today. They were very loud. They were thin on the ground in terms of their numbers, but they were there. And I think the King, in particular, supports people's rights to protest. So mm -hmm. he's quite happy for them to be there. Windsor's a little bit trickier because you have to get through past the policeman to be there. Uh, it right. may be because it's the King's first appearance. It may be because it's Easter Sunday. It is a time of joy, it is yeah. a time of celebration. Is that the right time to protest? And even today, JJ, again, I'm fully, we live in a fully democratic society. We are very fortunate that we can express our opinions. But today was about rewarding pensioners for supporting their local communities, doing things to help their neighbor. And so to then have the protesters there kind of reigning on their parade, it makes me question, is that really when we want to share the message when pensioners are being celebrated for everything they're doing? past, you know, a good age where they may not have quite the same level yeah. of energy, but the King would support the protesters if they're there. Well, we're going to talk about pensioners a little later on in the show and the waspy women. But one more question for you. The people of York have said they do not want Andrew to be called the Duke of York. I think King Charles would do very well and he'd win a lot of favour from the public if he stripped his brother of the title. How likely is that to happen? Unlikely, only because he doesn't have the power. So we can get it changed by law, though, right? Well, it would have to be up to parliamentarians. It would have to be up to the government. But I think this is where it becomes quite challenging for the king. He recognises that that was a gift given to the Duke of York by their late mother. That would be an argument. He's very sensitive to that. I think also he's worried, perhaps... Now I'm speculating, JJ. I haven't spoken to the king about this. <laughs> no, but I it's suspect, fine. you know, he's worried about... Andrew is not dealing well with all of this. He is a man who is arrogant. I'm not a fan either, but he's never been charged. He's never been investigated. Oh, he's well, never yeah. been convicted of a crime. So at what point do you start to say he's been put out to pasture, he's given up all his charities because he had to, mm -hmm. he lost all of his military affiliations. Yeah. He has nothing to do. He's leading a very quiet life, which is the right thing, and that's what the British public want from Prince Andrew. But then to take his title away, I think the King recognises that would really stick it would really hurt. Mm, good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. I know. I understand, I understand the argument and I understand why York, the, the people of York don't like that, yeah. that connection. Yeah. It, it makes so much sense. Just, seem, just seems a little bit strange that uh, Andy met this, never met this woman before and paid a few million quid. Oh, I never pay money to people I've never met before. But, you know, as you say, he's not been charged with anything, he's not been investigated, he denies all allegations, so fair play to him. Bless him. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria, thank you very much. Bless you. Happy Easter. <laughs> Happy Easter. Now, it's not all Hakuna Matata for Highlanders in Scotland, as wild boars have been running amok in the region, causing serious problems for locals of human and animal kind. The herds of feral pigs have been blamed for killing sheep and damaging grazing land on crofts and farms. Agency Nature Scott have said that dealing with the hog populations is a matter for the landowners, not for the governments. So let's hope they're not just hamming this whole thing up. I actually have a solution for that. Reintroduce the wolf. Since the 1960s, people have been saying in Scotland, let's bring the wolf back. The wolves will eat the pigs. Everyone wins. Anyway, you are watching the Independent Republic of JJ. Up next, the UN, which I think should stand for useful never. Well, they have once again proved utterly useless. Find out why in three. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, sir. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho, so you? <laughs> just yeah. you for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of JJ. Now, it's time for this. The world of woke. A new chair has been elected for the UN's commission on the status of women. Hurrah! How exciting. I wonder who she is and which forward-thinking country she's from. Well, her name is... Abdul Aziz Al Russell. Abdul Aziz is a bloke's name. All right, fair enough. Um, well, I bet it's from a very progressive country that will set a shining example to the world. And he is from Saudi Arabia. You what? Saudi Arabia is the new chair of the UN Commission that's supposed to promote gender equality and empower women around the world. Okay, well, want to hear some fun facts about being a woman in Saudi Arabia? There aren't any. There are, however, deeply regressive laws that make women second-class citizens vulnerable to domestic and sexual abuse, like uh, ruling that a woman has to obey her husband and her husband's financial support is dependent on said obedience. In fact, a woman refusing to have sex with her spouse or refusing to live in the marital home or travel with him without a legitimate excuse can also justify financial support being withdrawn. And that's the actual law, by the way, as of 2022. I'm not talking about old legislation. That is the law right now. Oh, and by the way, women couldn't drive in Saudi until 2018. I have socks and pants older than that law. To really rub salt in the wound, they'll be in the chair for next year's 30th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration, a landmark blueprint for advancing women's rights around the world. It's clear what the Saudis get out of this. Of course it's clear. They get a chance to pinkwash their image with paper feminism, pure lip service to the cause of women's rights to distract from what we all know is going on at home. But what's equally astounding is that their bid for leadership was completely unopposed. Now, in fairness to our country, Britain, we're not a member of the Commission on the Status of Women, so we didn't actually have a say in this. But maybe we should think again about whether the UN is really fit for purpose. My only hope from any of this is that with the spotlight shining on Saudi Arabia, they may feel the pressure to make meaningful changes to women's rights. But until they do, they're just another embarrassment to the world of woke. The world of woke. Now, after last week's Ombudsman report into the mismanagement of thousands of WASPy women, they'll be sorely disappointed by the government's response. Women against state pension inequality are demanding they receive compensation after the government failed to communicate state pension changes around the retirement age. MPs around the Commons have so far refused to commit to handling over any cash at all. And a spokesperson for the DWP said... We will consider the Ombudsman's report and respond in due course, having cooperated fully throughout this investigation. 
The government has always been committed to supporting all pensioners in a sustainable way that gives them a dignified retirement whilst also being fair to them and taxpayers. Well, let's bring in waspy woman Christine Galloway. Christine, good evening. Evening. So, Christine, tell us, please, how has all of this affected you personally? Uh, well, I was 58, I think, when I received my letter. And um, that was informing me that the pension age would be going up and I wouldn't be retiring at 60. It was going to be 62. And then very quickly after that, it went up to 63. And then in the blink of an eye, it changed to 66. I mean, I've been working all my life. Um, I started work at 15. And at 60, I had 44 qualifying years of national insurance. Um, at the moment, it states that you only need 35. Um, I lost a year. It should have been 45 um, because um, I stopped to have a baby. I stopped work to have a baby. Um, and, yeah, I, I mean, as I said, I've been working all my life. Um, and to go at 60, yeah, that's fine. It was it was in touching distance, but then moving it to 66, that was really quite devastating uh, mentally and physically for some as well. Yeah. Um, at 60, I was blessed with my first grandchild. Um, hmm. And I would have really liked to have given up work then to fully enjoy this precious time with him. But, you know, it's just... It, it really is unfair. It really is unfair. It is. I would, you, I would, I'd, go as far, sorry, I'd go as far as to say it's criminal, really. You've been working since age 15. You don't look yes. quite as old as you say you are. we we'll have to check <laughs> your, uh, your, your birth certificate, I think. But you think, of course, you think the WASP women should be compensated by the government then? Definitely, yes. Yeah, the government gained by not only not paying us their pensions at 60, they gained extra national insurance and tax from us from 60 to 66, and if you're still working, they're still claiming it. Although, when you get your, pen, your state pension, your national insurance contributions stop. Um, and at the moment, I've got 49 qualifying years, so. Um, but yes, so the situation isn't really good. They've got a win-win situation there. Um, and if you think about it, a succession of governments have failed us because babies born in the 50s, after the war, they knew that the birth rate had gone up. They've known it for years, the birth rate had gone up after the war, and it would naturally go up. Um, and, of course, this was a financial burden to the government. But nobody has taken responsibility for this. So they knew that there was going to be a huge population surge on pensions when we started reaching our 60s. And, you know, the government hadn't made plans for this all the way along. They've left it and left it and left it till whatever government was in Parliament so, then, yeah. ruling. And they've just not... It's just not fair, really yeah. not fair. Well, the Ombudsman has suggested um, a payment of up to £2,950 per person. I don't think that sounds like quite enough money, to be honest, but <laughs> how do you feel about that? Well, I'd like to know where they got the figure from. Um, would you be happy with that? Uh, absolutely not. I would absolutely not be... I'd, no, I'd, I think that's... It, it, that almost feels worse, to be honest. If it, it, It's yeah. embarrassing that, the, that they're suggesting such a small amount of money. Yeah. I know this will have an impact on the whole country because everybody else will be paying for it as well. But it's really... The, the book stops with the government, doesn't it, really? They, to my mind, they should have... When we reach 60, because they were going to increase their uh, retirement age, I feel they should have said, OK, you won't pay any more national insurance for your years because you've got your qualifying years now anyway um but i suppose something is better than nothing but i will be surprised if they actually get round to paying anything at all i don't have i don't hold much hope for that really yeah well it's likely we're going to have a labor government in power next do you have any faith in in keir starman co to make a difference <laughs> and make the changes i mean not one single mp from the opposition has come out and spoken about this you know, and silence speaks volumes, doesn't it, really? Yeah, you yeah. Know, they, they just haven't answered any questions. They've not even addressed the issue. I mean, to be quite honest, the Conservatives haven't either, but I think, you know, definitely Labour have not even quoted anything. Um, I know some MPs are for backing us, but um, 
yeah we'll we'll have to wait and see i think we need to take a rain check on that but i am severely disappointed in the government fabulous that we've got the ruling but it means nothing unless the government actually do something about it so itv obviously have done that drama about the post office mr bates versus the post office yeah. uh and that helped get publicity for for the cause it's put so much pressure on the government that they're finally starting to to, to do what do the right thing is that yeah. what's needed for the waspy women? Do we need a, a drama to make this make this more prevalent? If that's what it takes to to get it into the fore and in people's minds, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Well, in that case, I guess we have to suggest someone to play you in the drama. <laughs> Let's go with Natalie Natalie Portman. That's what I think. You got the bob. You got the glasses. Yeah, we'll go for Natalie Portman. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Christine Galloway. Thank you, JJ. <laughs> right, next up. Pub owners across Britain continue to fight for survival, with some now saying they are beyond... They are, sorry, they are being forced to close their doors as early as 8pm to cut costs. One publican has reported the electricity bill has soared by 1,000% in two years, with others working 18 hours each day just to stay afloat. More than 500 pubs called last orders for good in 2023, but will there be more closing their doors soon? Well, someone who knows firsthand the struggle the industry is facing is Victoria MacDonald, a publican in Norfolk and a member of the Campaign for Pubs. Victoria, thanks for joining me. How dire is the situation? Um, it's, it's very dire. Um, uh, absolutely no doubt about it. Um, the industry is at its knees. Not only are we trying to recover from the hit that was COVID, um, but we're obviously trying to struggle through the energy crisis and the um the the cost of living crisis and people's changing habits and the government has done absolutely nothing to support us and our massive industry uh in order to in order to survive so what is the biggest challenge facing pubs right now uh, it's well it's a bit of a perfect storm really uh what we've got is we've got rising costs um, not just in energy, which has been extortionate, and there's no government support. There was government support um, last year, but nothing since then. Um, the duty has been of absolutely no benefit to pubs whatsoever. Um, so the costs of the products are going up. And of course, um, our public have less money in their pockets. So we're damned if we put our prices up, and we're damned if we don't. Did the energy price cap achieve anything at all? Did, did that help? It was it was inconsequential. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that some uh, because of the way uh, business um, rates are set, many in cases um, we're looking at four, five, six hundred. We've even heard up to a thousand percent increases. Now, um, the, the, the government for me personally, I think the government cap helped me a year ago for about 300 pounds a month but my bills had actually gone up by £2,000 a month. So, wow. as they say, do the math. Yeah. There's no benefit in that at all. Now, what about the public? Uh, I know that there is, there, there is a some element of this, which is supply and demand, and people are going to the pub less than we used to. Absolutely, and people's habits have changed, and people's habits have changed since COVID, to be honest. Um, I think long gone are the hours when we used to stand at the door going, haven't you got homes to go to? Um, we had the 10 o'clock time cap for some time during COVID. And then post that, people's hours haven't kept the same. Um, I and mean, we have good nights, um, but many times and for many, many pubs and many publicans we speak to, you know, Mondays, Tuesdays, actually, why bother opening at all? Yeah. Um, or you're looking at a lunchtime only service and maybe closing at seven or eight o'clock in the evening. And that's a massive hit because you're still paying rates and rent and everything else on effectively 24 hours a day, but you've got a lot less income coming in. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, my local boozer is called the Duke of Richmond. It's in Hackney. Um, they have deals on every single day. There's a different deal, whether it's half price wine, whether it's a burger and beer for, for 10 quid. They're trying, to, they're trying hard to get people in. But the landlady said to me, 20% of everything straight away goes to the government. 40% goes yep. on staff costs, 30% is lost on ingredients. You've got 10% variable costs, 15% on fixed costs. She said for every thousand quid that they take, they're actually only, only actually making a profit of 40 pounds. I, I just don't see how this, how this is sustainable and how the government cannot actually intervene and say, we're gonna help. 
Absolutely. I mean, for, for way before the budget, um, not just this budget, but the budget before that, what we've been calling for is a cut in VAT. Going back to percentages, uh, you know, VAT is currently 20%. Well, 10% of something has to be better than 20% of nothing. Mm. Now we're talking about 509 pubs shutting in 2023. And the suggestion is that by June this year, 750 pubs will have shut. And we're just talking pubs as restaurants and other setups as well. They're talking about thousands of jobs. That's a massive loss to the economy in, in income tax, in um, national insurance, in VAT, everything. So surely to support us, you know, by cutting something like the VAT would have been, and we will still campaign for it as a campaign for pubs, would have been a better benefit. Duty, it's all very well for Jeremy Hunt to stand there and say, oh, but we've cut the duty. That is only a production cost. I can tell you now that um, beer prices have gone up by three, four, five, eight percent in some cases. Now, absolutely nothing has come out of that, of the cut in duty. Yeah, well, Victoria, thanks for your time and best of luck with the campaign. We will support you in any way that we can. We love our pubs. Thank <sighs> you very much, JJ. You're welcome. Now, you are watching the Independent Republic of JJ. Coming up, a peer broke down in tears at the post office scandal. So where are sub-postmasters on their fight for justice now? We are back in three. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ on Talk TV. Now, Tory peer and former MP Lord Arbuthnot 
who campaigned relentlessly for sub-postmasters, has broken down in tears as he listened to recordings proving that post office management knew its workers were not to blame for errors recorded by the Horizon IT system. Now let's bring in the panel, bring them back in. We've got Sam Lister. Sam, this proves that politicians do have a heart. Well, at least one of them. I can't tell you how hard Joseph Buffnot has campaigned on this. Right from the very start, he has led this. Um, a very decent man, absolutely adored by the, uh, the victims of this scandal. And I think it just shows how actually, despite the reputation politicians have, they can actually do really good work. Um, but he made the point that actually he thinks that people, uh, perhaps best if I don't name them, but obviously senior figures within the post office, he said, have lied. Lied to Parliament, uh, obviously the video, um, you can see various people being told the truth about the situation and then going on to give very different evidence. And I think it's time we saw somebody in the dock for this, you yeah. know? I think people do not understand why nobody is facing legal action over this. Mm -hmm. People's lives were ruined for decades and yeah. people at the very top echelons of the post office knew what was happening. Yeah, Tom, this is quite literally criminal. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense, Sam's absolutely right. People should be getting, getting tried and locked up for it. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, it's the, the injustice of the whole thing. People being, again, hauled over the coals, their, their lives ruined for doing absolutely nothing wrong. Then there was the gaslighting of all of it, being mm. told constantly that actually the computer says you did steal this mm. money or that there's no evidence that this, what you're suggesting has taken place, all of these things. The other thing is the time, the amount of time it has taken for them to even get a clear, fair hearing in the media. It took an ITV drama to catch the imagination of a few journalists before mm. this actually became properly front page news again. The, the least they deserve is obviously, first and foremost, to be properly compensated for what's taken place. But also the fact that there is quite clearly heads need to roll. And that doesn't just mean a few people issuing a few sorry sounding statements and a few people being shuffled at the top layer of the post office. It's the fact that clearly this is criminal and should be investigated. Yeah, so. people literally languished in prison. Mm. Some people have died going to their graves with people thinking that they were guilty of something. But Sam Dowler, what does this say about us as a nation that it's actually taken an ITV drama to, to make any real significant well, that's, difference. That's the thing, it's, there's, there's such a feel of Britishness about it, isn't there? There's like, you look at the people you, who, and it, it does kind of choke you up a bit, you know, that they went to their graves with people thinking they were liars and, mm. and thieves. Mm -hmm. and, and in your mind you think, well, how, how, how could that happen? Like, surely if it was you and someone was saying that about you and you knew you didn't do it, yeah. and you just would be like, no, I didn't do it over and over and over and over again, and yet it happened to a number of people within the same company and, no and nothing was said. And like, and like you say, like, why did it take an ITV, a freaking ITV drama yeah. to, to highlight it again? Mm. And here we are, like, so if that drama hadn't happened, would we be not even talking about it again? And like, yeah. and, 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 and they wouldn't, and nobody's payments would be coming out. Yeah. No one's, you know, exoneration would be happening. Mm -hmm. And like, these are older people as well, some of them. And they're like, oh, just make you feel upset. Yeah. Like, yeah. they're people who like work, like older people who work in like a little local town mm. and stuff. And mm -hmm. like, and, and all the town thinks they're scum and all the town yeah. thinks that they've tried to steal from the post office. Yeah. It's shocking. And like, so I'm not surprised he gets upset about it because this is, this is, it's, it's, it's real people. Mm. It's mm. real people going through not just a bit of a struggle, but having their lives and their reputations ruined. Absolutely. Well, let's move on. Sam Lister, Scotland. Uh, sorry, this is another depressing story, but Scotland, <laughs> Scotland are going to be the first country to take part in assisted dying? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is actually something uh, we at the Daily Express are campaigning on, and we'd like to see Good. this actually come into Westminster. Uh, we have a campaign on assisted dying. We want, um, we want a change in the legislation. It has had a phenomenal response. More than 100,000 people backed our petition. And as a result, there's going to be a debate in Parliament. Unfortunately, it's not a binding debate, but it will raise the issue in Parliament, which will obviously uh, bring great attention to it and hopefully move the dial on this a bit. But Scotland is, to be fair, leading in the way, way on this. Legislation has been introduced in Holyrood. Uh, I can't really tell you how uh, expectations are on how far that will progress. But obviously, it is, it is that first toe in the water. And there does seem to have been a shift in public opinion on this. Mm -hmm. I think five, ten years ago, people were still very, very concerned about the implications of changing the law. But now, with Dame Mester Ranson mm, yeah. speaking so passionately and so uh, in such a dignified way about her battle, I think that really has changed hearts and minds. Well, there, was, there were stats recently saying that um, it's every every demographic, every age group mm, and every yeah. party, and like everybody agrees with it. We've all known someone, had someone... Uh, 
work. But is there not pressure then um, on some elderly people who are going to feel, well, actually, yeah, I'm a burden to my family. They can't really afford to keep me in, yeah, but in, get a, in well, the home. But that's why they have, they, have, they have processes in place in other countries which we can have as well, like whether, whether it's having two lawyers, three family members yeah. there and deciding, like, I know, for example, we all know some, like my mother would not would, I don't would know. not want mm. would Tom, not want to Tom, hang this, around. This, this, no, this no. to me sounds like murky area. I, I agree actually, and this isn't um, something which um, I understand is discussed lightly. But at the same time, if we are going to look at other countries and experience of that, if anything, it has been one of the slippery slopes. Take Canada for example. So over the course of the past ten years, they went from having what they call medical assistance in dying, basically mm -hmm. assisted dying, in very limited circumstances, someone who's within six months of um, dying of terminal illness. Um, it has now vastly expanded to the point where there's been horror stories of people who really had nothing else wrong with them other than a bit of chronic back pain and fear of become, being made homeless who have been able to access this. Almost anywhere it's been tried, the slippery slope has kind of proven itself to be real. And I, I, I genuinely fear, and this is not from a conservative perspective or religious perspective, not in my case at all, that it, it has just proven itself to be a slippery slope everywhere that it's been tried, unfortunately. And we can talk about safeguards, but they seem to loosen very quickly. As soon as now, listen, I don't want to get attacked for this next story because I'm going <laughs> to kind of attack a British national institution, Sir David Attenborough. <laughs> How much money is this geezer raking in? <laughs> <laughs> who who cares? Enough. Let's give him money. And who, who cares? Yeah. Who cares? He yeah. absolutely, he absolutely <laughs> deserves it. £7,000 yeah. an hour? Great, great. And our licence fees are going up. He is absolutely worth it. He's in his 90s. The things he's done for this world, the whole world, yeah. by highlighting things like... He's earning more like, than a Premier League footballer. A great. Would you think they're worth it? Absolutely well, yeah. they're not. Well, the money they bring in, <laughs> yeah, yeah well, for the economy, is in the money they're paying taxes, yeah, I'd say they are actually yeah, but, worth it. Yeah, but you he's, can't, he's you can't, you can't tell me that Kyle Walker deserves the same amount of money yeah. as David Attenborough. He's Come on. He's his whole life, as you say. He's in his 90s. Give the man a break for yeah. those <laughs> Well, I said I'd get attacked by people. I didn't mean that in the studio. <laughs> on my own wall cabinets. <laughs> Flipping it. Uh, 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 Tom, help me out here. Come on. <laughs> 7,000 pounds. Uh, an hour by this geezer. Our uh, 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 lights fee is going to go up as well next year, apparently. This is a, it's a it's bit not his It's a lot of money. It's a bit pricey, right? <laughs> if it's Gary Lineker, yeah, like, if it's Gary like, Lineker, you'd also be going few years left. Yeah. He's got a couple of years left. But you know, this, <laughs> he's not unlike Gary Lineker as far as like what he does. As Gary Lineker, brilliant football pundit, you know, if you're talking about David Attenborough, wonderful document documentary maker, both of them actually terrible opinions. <laughs> as far as Gary Lineker well, just no, that's the enough. same but, as David Attenborough. No, 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 First, lagging off <laughs> at <Attenborough. Boo>. <laughs> <laughs> well, That is all from me tonight. You've been watching The Independent Republic of JJ and Isiobi. A big thank you to my War Cabinet. And I'll see you again on Monday, only here on Talk TV. Good night. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fort.